here, so here we go. So five, four, three, two, and one. All right, guys, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. Very excited to have as my guest today, Rachel Moore. Rachel, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. All right. So Rachel is an EMDR therapist in private practice based in San Diego, California, who works primarily with creative clients, writers, artists, and musicians. A former journalist, Rachel recently has had an article published in the San Diego Union Tribune about grief and loss related to the coronavirus pandemic. Rachel has presented at the San Diego State University Writers Conference and has been leading groups based on the book, The Artist's Way, for more than a decade to help clients overcome creative blocks. Indeed. Awesome. I read that book when it came out. Loved it. Yeah, it's good stuff. All right, so let's dive in here. So you're, uh, are you from San Diego? Or is- no, I grew up in near Boise, Idaho. Okay. Okay. Yeah. How long have you been in San Diego? Well, I've been in Southern California for 20 years now. Okay. Just this summer will be 20 years. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Nice. So how are you dealing with, uh, you know, obviously we're, we're recording this in the time of the pandemic, coronavirus, et cetera. How have right. you been managing and dealing it's been really interesting. I just actually posted something uh, on my blog today about my decision to give up my physical office, which was, I know a lot of us like therapists. Are- permanently? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I, I had somebody take over the lease and it was one of those situations where I had been thinking about it. What am I going to do about this? I personally don't feel safe returning until there's a vaccine or you know a lot of testing and tracing or something like that, right? Where I feel confident enough right. to return. And um, someone else was looking for a space to do teletherapy from because they had roommates and a cat that just wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't really working out for them at their house. And for some reason, when she posted that, that she was looking for a full-time space, it was just boom, oh, this is what I'm going to do and this is how it's going to happen. Wow. And I had to catch up with the reality of right. I'm going to give up my space because right. Part of it too is that things have been going really well online, even with EMDR, much to my surprise, which is great. Um, but yeah, it was it was a bit of a process with some tears and you know. Interesting. I I haven't really uh, heard people talk about that. I mean, but the fact that they're giving up their offices and yeah, which is kind of crazy. I mean, you talked about a um, um, a vaccine. You know, I was talking with right. someone yesterday, and they were like, well we still don't have a vaccine for HIV. Right. I mean, which is a different type of of virus, but, but yeah, no, that's a really good point. It's like that, that of any of the viruses, right. You would think like, okay, we got to put all our resources toward that. Right. And there's never been one as far as I know for a coronavirus. Yeah. I don't know, but I don't know either. (laughs) Yeah. It's just interesting (laughs) to think about all the different uh, ramifications of this. Yes. So let's kind of dive in here. You know, what really intrigues me and the reason why I love doing this podcast is getting to talk to people like you who are working to help people, uh, specifically in in the realm of trauma. So walk us through your journey. How the heck did you get into this field? Oh my goodness. Okay. So I was actually a journalist. I was a uh, newspaper copy editor for 14 years. My undergraduate degree was in creative writing. I went to a small liberal arts school. And actually my first experience with therapy was right after I graduated from from undergrad. And my therapist, I wrote to him later and told him I am a therapist now because he literally said, how did you not get into this field? (laughs) Which was sweet, but I was like, "Ah." you know, I'm like 22. I'm like, who am I gonna help at that time? I mean, for me right now. (laughs) So, had my career as a journalist. And then there were a few reasons why I wanted to shift. One of them being, you know, the world of journalism has changed completely. And what I started out in was not the same thing Mm -hmm. that I was in. Now, another thing was that I always worked uh, swing shift. So I always worked like 3 p.m. to midnight, you know, that type of thing, which was fine for me. Well, then I got married and (laughs) my husband, bless him, you know, he was like, yeah, I think it'll be okay. And then about after about a year, he's like, yeah, it's not okay. <laughs> because we, it was almost like being in a long distance relationship, you know? So, right. So that was sort of the, the history of it. But I've always been interested in um, psychology. And I mean, I think to me, being somebody who's interested in literature and writing and psychology, I mean, to me, those are the same things. Right. I don't see any different. You know, sometimes people will tell me like, oh, wow, that's such a difference. I'm like, no, I love people's stories and I love helping them, you know, using um, their stories and their experience. 
So how did things unfold? You went to school right. or went back so to, went school to school or what? Yeah, I went to school in, um, I guess I started in 2010 and um, graduated. And then it took me a year to actually commit to doing the 3000 hours that we need in California <laughs> of training in order to sit for the license. That was a big decision. And um, then I was trying to figure out like, well, who am I gonna, right? Who, are, who am I gonna help? What, what am I possibly gonna do? <laughs> and then I finally realized like, oh, wait a minute, I can help people like me, right? Who are creative people just trying to figure out their way in the world who don't mm -hmm. often get represented, represented or supported in ways, I think in our culture that are really helpful. So um, that's why I decided um, on that. But, and then I was able to, I was actually a hospice counselor as part of my internships and I was able um, to get um, training through HAP, the Humanitarian uh, Assistance Program, I think is what it stands for, um, mm -hmm. for EMDR. So okay. I was able to get uh, discounted training for that, which was a wonderful opportunity because I was working for this nonprofit hospice and um, then just went from there. Mm -hmm. um, got licensed in 2017 and, and um, yeah, have been for the past year, been pretty full. <laughs> wow, people. wow. Yeah, yeah. So what is it about um, creative types, quote unquote? Um, obviously, you said you were, you are one and, yes. and that was kind of your lead in there. But you also said they don't get represented in terms of yeah. being supported. Talk, talk more about that. Well, I think there are a lot of things. I think a lot of things that creative people hear, and certainly I have heard, are, you know, phrases like, oh, you must have a lot of time on your hands if you're able to, you know, be musical or paint a picture, write a story or something like that. It's, it's, it's like these pejoratives, you know, like, oh, that's a waste of time. You should be doing something productive. You should be making money from your, yes. like, I made a decision a long time ago. I would never be paid to sing because it was too tender for me it was too sacred you know mm -hmm. it's like and yet you know some people who are close to me are like man if I had your voice I'd be out there you know making money blah, blah. I think it's a very American or western whatever you know <laughs> idea that we have to capitalize and monetize well also too any, it, it yeah. somehow like, legitimizes us right if yeah. you're making able to make money there's also that question uh have you sold anything you know Right. Yeah. Question, where are you published? Yeah. Right. Where, what have you? What do you? What do you write? Where are you published? Well, I'm like, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> Does it matter? I don't know. It doesn't matter to me, but it seems to matter to to this person who's asking me. And what does that mean? And you know. And and then if we're talking more specifically about therapy, I remember one time I was telling my therapist at the time about my friend's electric piano and how when you sat down and you pushed the keys, it felt just like playing a piano. Even as I talk about it now, I'm getting chills. Right. And I was trying to explain this to her and she's kind of like, oh, is that like good or, you know, and it's not her fault. I mean, <laughs> there's right, nothing wrong right. with, with her. However, I would like to be the type of person that I would want to go to that would understand the importance of creativity, understand sometimes it's a life or death thing and, and the importance of right. art. Like I was supposed to be at the symphony right now. And, and I really, you know, had a lot of grief around that yeah, during the yeah. pandemic, you know? And so like the real, real, real deep, spiritual, you know, whatever you want to label it as an individual mm -hmm. importance of creativity. I felt like in a therapeutic setting, that would be really important to mm. recognize and just to have an understanding. I'm wondering if you, I, I don't usually do this on, on the podcast, but mm -hmm. um, I wonder if we can get more specific and you can maybe talk about a particular client or kind of a mashup of clients, because I, I want to know what this looks like. Sure. I myself, uh, wrote fiction for a long time mm -hmm. and cool. had that issue where my father just did not mm -hmm. get it. And it was a waste of time. And it really right. did impact myself and self-esteem yeah. and the trajectory of a, of, of a lot of what I did. But for those people, this is kind of an interesting topic that I really haven't talked too much about on here. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure a lot of people might be listening and what do you, what what do you mean creative types and mm -hmm. they're not getting support? So what does it look like when you're working with someone or might, yeah. uh, granted it's going to look differently for a lot of people, but sure. give us an example. Well, for example, like, you know, I might work with a singer, like I've worked with a couple of opera singers and I've sung opera myself. And so I like, it's hard to explain, you know, exactly 
what that connection would be. But I literally understand even for such, you know, things such as just technical terms. Like we don't have to waste time. You know, they're like, oh, I did this and that. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I get it, get it. Okay, great, go ahead. Right. Um, and then I sort of like how, like, for example, I might work with somebody who's a dancer. I'm not as familiar um, with the dance world. And yet she is able to explain it to me in a way that I'm, you know, like open to and, and I, under, I learn the terms, you know, right. and I try to speak to her in her language. So it's just, it's just like, you know, anybody else would do with like a cultural difference. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I know those aren't like super specific. Um, and I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, just things like that, that just, <laughs> it's funny. There's a part of me that just really loves efficiency. And I, <laughs> I love just being able to just save time, right? Like mm -hmm. you don't have to explain it to me, just, you know, I've been there, I've done that. Yeah, let's go and let's, you know, do the EMDR or let's do whatever we need to do, you know. Um, I also think it helps make it safe for my clients. Um, again, to know that I'm not gonna judge them. I'm not gonna say like, why are you wasting your time on this? We would never say that to a client, but. <laughs> sure, sure. But in particular, yeah, I'm going to have empathy and understanding um, and and be able to support them again in this idea about how important it is to them and it's not just maybe it's not just a hobby or a side mm -hmm. project or whatever yeah mm -hmm. it's important to their being yeah yeah that really speaks to me as well because I, I think you know you said oftentimes it can be a life or death yes thing and that that might sound like an exaggeration but it but it's so true I mean it, it really defines how people move through the world um, for yourself doing this work mm -hmm. um, do you how do you approach it I mean are you uh, what kind of modalities have you kind of been drawn to that that allow mm -hmm. you to do this work well I think EMDR primarily you know it's interesting how um, when I was doing my training for EMDR about halfway through or something, I went to a consultant and I had thought of it before this as like a tool. You know, it's like any other tool, blah, blah, blah. She explained, no, this is a theory. <laughs> and I thought, I am, I am not one to like really, you know, um, sign on to like really specific, uh, this is the way we're going to do it. And this is the only way like, this is just like not me at all. However, I realized I kind of joke about this when I talk to people about it. Like I consciously drank the Kool-Aid when it came to EMDR. I was like, I, if I'm going to use this, I'm going to have to be all in. Right. And so I do, I see, you know, everything from the AIP, the adaptive perspective, uh, when it comes to, to trauma. Um, even if we're not doing you know, reprocessing the eye movements, I will think about it that way. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, you know, what's happening in the memory network and things like that. So, you know, it, it's kind of a boring answer, but, <laughs> but EMDR is really where I come from uh, and what I do. And um, I find it can be really helpful with, you know, things like, like creative blocks, things like trauma around just trauma around creativity and people's experience mm -hmm. with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And talk a little bit about the specifics of EMDR. I mean, we've talked, sure. a little, we've talked about it on this podcast, but for those yeah. uh, listeners who aren't too familiar with it, um, yeah. is it just for trauma? Can people work with EMDR for other things too? Yeah, that's such a great question. So of course, EMDR stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, which is always a huge mouthful. And I wish there was another name for it. But I, I love this question because, you know, I'll explain it to people. And when they called it to consult with me or whatever, and I'll say, you know, like, if there's a little T trauma or a big T trauma, and what that means is like, you know, a small thing that happens that's, that's upsetting, a big thing that happens that's traumatic, it can get stuck in the brain. And so that when it's triggered, you can have the same sights, thoughts, uh, smells, feeling as if it's happening right now. And I talk about REM sleep. There's a couple of different theories as to why EMDR works. We know it does work, but we don't know how or why, which I think is true mm -hmm. for a lot of our modalities. Um, and one of the theories is that when we're in, <clears throat> excuse me, is that when we're sleeping and our eye movements are going, you know, eyes are going back and forth in REM, um, that's the brain sort of processing our memories. I, I don't know if this is accurate, but I always say like, you know, like, yeah, I had a sandwich yesterday for lunch. Okay, do I need to remember that was that important? Nah, just throw it into long-term storage. It's fine. <laughs> but trauma can interrupt that process. And so it gets stuck. And um, 
EMDR, through EMDR, we use eye movements or other what we call like bilateral stimulation. So sounds, um, you, the clients can, in this format, clients can tap on their legs or their shoulders or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, we use that to we stimulate the information and use that to reprocess it so that we can keep the stuff that's useful because there are useful things to be learned from traumatic experiences and digest or get rid of the stuff that's not useful so it's not as distressing to us in our day-to-day -day lives anymore. So that's the sort of the, <laughs> the quick and dirty explanation I use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That 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 makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I'm wondering about w w with regards to you know creative types, creative people. Yeah. I mean that, that that feels a little clunky to say that, but okay. um, do creative people respond more better to EMDR? Oh. How? Mm. I don't think it really has much to do with that um well gosh you know i don't know i wonder okay i do wonder i haven't done any studies <laughs> i probably should but i wonder if having a brain that makes connections like we do when we're being creative right like when we do when we're writing especially i think having a brain that makes connections and associations i think can be really helpful and my own experience of emdr as a client is that it feels very much like the creative process. It feels, mm -hmm. for me too, it feels a lot like dreaming, but it's like, okay, we go over here and then we go over here. Oh yeah, it all connects mm -hmm. here. You know, we kind of like, so it makes me very curious. And actually that's a really great question. Yeah, yeah. In terms of uh, like a clinical errors you've made, a lot mm -hmm. of the, this is one of the questions I, I ask because a lot of people get a lot of grist for the mill out of this question. Yeah. Share, share one of your clinical errors you've made and how that impacted you, what you learned from it. Sure. So <laughs> probably my worst um, clinical error was my very first client, like very first when I was still a student. She left, she, she ended early. Oh boy. <laughs> she was like, yeah, I'm not doing this. And I, I had an interesting response. Um, it's interesting to think about it later too, and I'll talk about that, but I had an interesting sponsor, so I was very angry. I was, you know, this was not how it was supposed to go. And then it got even more awkward because, I mean, I wasn't angry at her, but it was like internally. And then it got awkward because I was working at the YMCA and then we took cash or whatnot, and she gave me cash and she needed change and I didn't have change and I had to go bother some other people for change. So I had to like acknowledge and admit to them that like my, my, my session was, I think, early and this person needs change. And it was so awkward and it was so tough. So thinking about it now, I, I really think that what was, what happened for me in that situation and frankly, that whole traineeship was that the modality they were using did not line up with me and my values mm -hmm. and my way of seeing the world. It's not a bad modality. In fact, I use it, you know, every now and then um, for things, which is, which is bow and family systems, which is mm -hmm. fine. But, but like I said, I don't really like to sign on to, <laughs> you know, things whole hog necessarily. And I remember telling a trainee friend at this, at this same traineeship, she was like, I don't know, you know, I don't know about this Bowen thing. And I don't know how to think of it or what to do. And I was like, okay, you just, I'm so sorry for any Bowen people out there. It's not about Bowen. That's about where I was at. I was like, you need to realize that this is a cult that we're in. Okay. <laughs> and just think of it like a cult. If you deviate, you know, at all from the cult, you're going to get punished. Like you're going to get mm -hmm. knocked down because they want, because you got to sign on, you got to be in the cult. Right. So, so just, just act like that and we'll get through this and it'll be okay. You know, but I remember from that first session, I was, I don't even remember like what I said, but it was so, I was so trying to apply this model mm -hmm. into just relating with a person. And I didn't know yet, you know, I hadn't read Irvin Yalom saying like the relationship is the most important part, nor was that supported, you know, like from mm -hmm. my, my supervisor at the time, not at all. It was the, the model, the model, the model, right? Yeah. And even now, even though I say like, you know, I've drunk the Kool-Aid on EMDR, I know, and I still understand that the relationship is the healing part mm -hmm. of, of the therapy. And I, and I truly believe that. Um, I like how he says, you know, the techniques are just, and the theories are just like, we got to do something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Right. Like but, I do think EMDR probably does something from what I've seen, but ultimately we just need to have something to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I appreciate that response. I mean, I think it's really important what you said that that particular modality just, it didn't, feel right it didn't fit right mm -hmm. and 
that you know, yesterday we had a um, one of our member calls in my membership community, Trauma Therapist mm -hmm. 2.0, and there was a question about uh, that touched upon how do you know which modalities to go to, to, mm -hmm. to study, to pursue? And people were talking about that point, you know, some things don't fit. Talk about that. How did, mm. how do you, how does one go about <laughs> finding that thing that fits? How did you know oh. EMDR felt right for you? Wow. I don't know why that makes me feel emotional for some reason. Uh, I feel like some tears coming up. That's interesting. Um, my first thought when you asked, how do you know, it's like you just throw things against the wall and see what sticks. I mean, that's kind of how the process felt for me, rightly or wrongly. Um, I was with EMDR. I was an EMDR client before I, before I studied it and was trained in it. So that helped, helped, you know, I'd already kind of bought into this as something that works. So, so that helped a bit. You know, for a while early on, I really liked CBT. You know, I like the idea of uh, uh, changing thoughts and, and you know how that affects emotions and behaviors or whatnot. Um, I don't know how one comes to it. I just know that when you find it, when I found it, um, it just it felt right. You know, and and for me, it was like the combination of thoughts, feelings, and body. Right. Mm -hmm. The past the present and the future i mean it just seemed to encompass like the whole person whereas i know it's kind of like for me like i know that intellectually i mean you know all of us in this business are smart like intellectually um i can understand things it doesn't help the back part of my brain that's traumatized right it doesn't mm -hmm. help the fight or flight you know or freeze or fawn reaction and um i didn't know until emdr i didn't really know how to approach that part you know the traumatized part i think cbt can be great for maybe not traumatic things maybe mm -hmm. it is. i don't know but that's just my opinion um but yeah that was that seemed to make a difference ad addressing the trauma and this idea that um uh, uh, it's important for modality to to feel right in in your hands in a sense um is, is what crucial it's uh vital to doing this work i think to be honest with you i think it's vital to being successful at this work yeah there was even a study i remember from school where um they said you know what are the what are the the factors that lead to uh good client outcomes right and i'm sure there's been lots of studies like this but i remember this study in particular and of course the biggest factor was the client <clears throat> excuse me was the client buy-in like right they're they're willing to be there. They want to do the work. The second factor was the therapist's belief in their modality. That was the second biggest factor that would predict good client outcomes. And I think that's really important, right? I need to, I mean, just for me personally, like I really, really need to, um, <laughs> again, not in a cult-like way, but <laughs> stand by what I'm doing, right? Have conviction. And be open to other things. Like, I'm totally open to, you know, maybe something else uh, besides EMDR. You know, the next great thing evolves and becomes great. I'll get trained on it. I'll learn it, right? I'll, I'll change and adapt and do whatever needs to happen. And in the meantime, you know, would I be my own client? Yeah, I would. I think that's important. I don't want to, do, to be, you know, a therapist that I wouldn't want to see to kind of take Groucho Marx's uh, <laughs> comment a little bit mm -hmm. different there, but yeah, like, um, yeah, I think it's extremely important. And again, like I said, extremely important for, for good client outcome. Mm -hmm. and, and in terms of, uh, you know, the, the creativity mm -hmm. and I want to kind of put it back on you. Okay. What, how do you use creativity as a therapist? It's a great question. You know, it was interesting writing my little blog piece about, about giving up my office, what I wrote in there was like, I think this is the biggest creative project I've ever done, was just creating my office, mm. you know, designing it, having the space, you know, all that. So that definitely came into play. Also, I think the importance again of having an open mind and coming in just like as a blank slate, you mm -hmm. know, or the blank page, right? You know, just, just <clears throat> also having, um, a beginner's mind that we talk about that a lot in art and creativity right and well mindfulness too of course but like um i think that 
I don't know if this exactly answers your question, but I, it kind of does. I think that being a therapist and being an artist are one of the most humbling things that you could do because you never know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen when I, you know, start writing something or open my mouth to sing. Like, I hope, I think I know what's mm-hmm. going to happen, but you never know, right? I never know when somebody comes into the office or I see them online, what they're going to come with, right? So I have to be adaptive and, and think on my feet and, you know, and use all those skills that I bring to art and writing and singing and music. And to me, it's all the same, uh, mm-hmm. it's all the same stuff. So to, yeah, to, to be creative in therapy, I think is just to do therapy. <laughs> and to get to that point where you're able to, to, to not only say that, but to live that and yeah. embody that, was that a process for you? Well, yeah, because I think about that very first client, right? That was definitely mm-hmm. not it. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and for my time there was, was not it. Um, I think it was a process of becoming confident as a clinician, becoming more confident. Um, I, it's funny, like, it's really weird. Our, I mean, our job is like so weird anyway. Um, <laughs> it's like, and one of the weird parts of it is that you don't really know how you compare to other people. And so you don't really know where you are. I mean, it's not super important but it's a factor right mm-hmm. it reminds me it reminds me of when i was working uh at the newspaper at one of the, my newspaper jobs and i was kind of you know getting up in the ranks or whatever and so one of my jobs was to write headlines and then the job above that was to like approve the headlines that other people wrote and fix them and then send them off to be printed right so i was sort of promoted to that job of um approving other people's headlines and i realized i was like Oh, I didn't know I was that good. <laughs> so I saw everybody else, right? In their sort of raw form. I mean, I was obviously make mistakes a lot too, but like, you never know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, definitely the process of becoming more confident and realizing like, okay, no, I think that I'm, I think I'm doing okay here. <laughs> mm-hmm. That helps me feel open up, you know, and have more freedom around like, okay, I don't have to have a set agenda. I can just right. respond uh, to what's happening right now. Yeah. Right, right. Let me just remind everyone that I'm speaking with Rachel Moore. Um, Rachel, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you? Oh, sure. Um, best way is probably just to go to my website. There's a contact page on there, uh, rachelmoorecounseling.com. Okay, rachelmoorecounseling.com. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'll have that linked up at the show notes page here at the traumatherapistpodcast.com. All right, let's g- get a go-to book recommendation from you, whether – trauma related or not or sure. c- creatively related or not what would you say you, you probably won't be surprised with this answer i would definitely recommend the artist's way by julia cameron okay um it's a little it's funny it's a little outdated in certain ways there's so many anachronisms it's kind of cute but um <laughs> um because it's like 20 more than 25 years old i think however the way that she it's one of those books that probably for a lot of people is like the Bible or another like religious text. Like I come back to that book and I change. And so I find new things in that book. Mm. The book doesn't change, but I change and I read different chapters. I read different parts and I'm like, wow, I never, gosh, I'd never thought about it that way. Or I don't remember this being in here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's one of those magical books that I appreciate so much for that. Just if you could, for those people who aren't familiar with the book, just give us a little brief uh, descriptor of what it is. Sure, sure. Um, Yeah, I think she calls it like a a spiritual path toward um, creativity or something like discovering and uncovering your creativity. Is there some sort of thing like that? It's a way for people to really come back to perhaps that feeling that they had as a kid when they were making art and doing things. And then things happen, trauma happens, frankly, along the way to shut that down. And this is a way of reclaiming that for yourself. And it's in 12 chapters. I have a feeling, I don't know if she's ever talked about it, but I have a feeling they're sort of analogous to the 12 steps. I get that that sense. Hmm. Um, But it's really interesting how the chapters sort of layer onto each other too. But there are 12 chapters, just really brief, but deep and dense, uh, but accessible essays, and then some tasks to do at the end. Um, I've met a few people who have read the book and done the tasks on their own. um, Although for most people, it helps to find a group. Um, to do that with. I've thought about running a group online, but, you know, I've been adjusting to everything so far. It hasn't quite come to fruition yet, but groups can be really helpful to get accountability and also just to get um, input from other people, I think is really mm-hmm. helpful. Awesome. Awesome. The Artist Way by Judith Cameron. For me, I know when uh, I Julia, went through that yeah. book. Yeah. Is it, was it Julian? 
Julia. Julie, Julie Cameron. Julia Cameron, yeah. Julia Cameron, thank you. Uh-huh. Uh, sure. When I first found that book and and did it, I found it just very kind of affirming. Yeah. Like, okay, I'm a creative type. Yes, you know it's okay to be <laughs> to be doing this and to feel this way. That's yeah. that's what I got out of it. Yeah. And I really appreciated that. But sure. uh, anyway, uh, delight having you on here, talking to you. What's what's next for you? What are you doing? <sighs> Wow, I don't know. <laughs> What's like next for any losses? of us? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think um, it's a good question. Well, it, I, I don't know. This just comes to mind. Um, I, it's so strange now, kind of not being able to go anywhere and yet knowing I need time off. And so I did this thing in my practice that I've wanted to do for a long time, which is to really schedule out every two months I'm going to take a week off. Mm. Um, and that's to catch up on stuff with my business to, you know, just relax. Um, I don't know why that comes up. It's not really, you know, a huge thing, I guess. And yet it's very important for me, you know, to actually do that thing I've been wanting to do. Um, so maybe during those times, um, I'll come up with some, some ideas of stuff. I mean, I'm like, I feel like so busy right now, which is great. <laughs> Um, yet, and I know that there's something else out there for me to do and I haven't quite figured out what it is yet. So maybe that's what I'm doing next. What I'm doing next is figuring out what that is. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. (laughs) Well, good luck. Um, thank you. Having given up your office and doing work in the, in this realm. I appreciate it. Appreciate you coming on here. All right. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.